Well, thank you for checking out Public Finance Conversation with Philman Rollup and Associates. But today we have Sean McCarthy, uh, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of BAM. And we'll explain what BAM is and how they've come into existence. But Sean, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, Sean has quite the resume, so I'm going to turn it over to him to walk us through uh, both BAM and his background. Uh, sure. Uh, first, um, I, I want to, uh, you know, uh, thank uh, Field and Rollup and, um, and Adam for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, today. Uh, uh, interestingly, our first transaction that we underwrote in California, uh, we uh, uh, Field and Rollup was uh, the financial advisor for that transaction. Um, and since then, we've done uh, 94 transactions together for a total of $1.75 billion worth of transactions. So we are we're very proud of our relationship together and think we've done a lot of um, good things uh, in the state of California for a number of really great issuers. So uh, let me um, step back first before I describe myself and just tell you a little bit about BAM and what we do. Uh, uh, BAM actually stands for Build America Mutual. We are a AA rated by Standard & Poor's insurance company that guarantees municipal bonds solely. So, um, in essence, what, uh, our role in the market is to lower the cost of financing for municipalities. And so when we guarantee it, it's a little like uh, if you guaranteed co-signed your, your child's student loan, um, we hope uh, they pay, but if they don't, we're there to pay without any arguments on time, uh, every time. So that's, that's what we do for, for a business. Now, I started my career uh, almost 40 years ago at uh, EF Hutton, uh, which is a, originally a California-based firm, uh, in public finance. And back then, public finance and, and uh, asset finance were the same thing. In fact, all the original asset-backed deals came from public finance in the form of single-family and multifamily housing transactions. But um, So I was a banker there and then joined um, FSA, uh, originally and sort of worked my way up to being the president of FSA over 22 years. Um, so uh, during the crisis in 2009, we were um, uh, acquired, FSA was acquired by Sure Guarantee, where at that time I was the chief operating officer of the merged entity. Um, but we decided that uh, perhaps there was a role in the market uh, and what investors ultimately may want is um, a bond insurer that was addressing some of the fundamental issues that had happened in the market in the past. And that was um, the idea to resolve the conflict of interest between policyholder interests and shareholder interests. And so uh, BAM was uh, put together as a mutual insurance company. And what that really means is that we are a AA rated insurance company, that our major stakeholders are the municipalities that take the insurance. And so there is no conflict between ourselves and, and the issuers, because our role in the market is to be bigger and stronger and to lower the cost of funding for our members, which are the municipalities, and to provide through credit profiles, um, dis tr ultimate transparent disclosure of every transaction that we underwrite every year available on our website for free. So in, in essence, that's what BAM is. Um, and now sort of almost 40 years later, um, and eight years into our business, we have uh, underwritten over $80 billion worth of transactions across the country and, um, and really think of ourselves as a um, utility for both investors who are to um, get additional information, continuing disclosure on the credits that we guarantee, and also to members where we not only serve in lowering their cost of funding at the time we do our transaction, but we also work with them, uh, such as now through the COVID crisis, um, on a number of different issues. If there were bumps in the road, we we're there to, to work with them and do that with great um, uh, alacrity. Um, I, I would note that uh, throughout this crisis and up until October 1st, we have had no defaults on our portfolio since inception. So, um, and that's a, that's a both, um, a function of our credit selection. Uh, and that really means that when we're muni only, what we do is revenue bonds, 
um, and general obligation bonds, which are the two core businesses that um, are defined public finance. And that means we we don't do, uh, and this is in our charter, we don't do extra territories. So the Virgin Islands, Guam, or Puerto Rico. Uh, we don't do asset back financing, and we don't do uh, any 501c3. So no hospitals that are um, uh, qualified in that direction, or private universities or museums. And we really think the reason we concluded that for our, our credit appetite is uh, to focus on what we think are essential purpose public finance um, issues. And, and to that end, that's, um, I think, worked out pretty well for us. So that being said, um, let me share with you the things that in this market sort of keep me up at night because, you know, it's, it's not all just, you know, a, a risk-free free world. Um, and so there are a number of, uh, I'd say there's, you know, three, arguably four fundamental areas that, you um, at BAM, we focus on, um, and uh, I, I would just want to point out that right now, really the highlight of putting BAM together at, um, was the fact that we've got great people um, top to bottom in the company, both on our legal surveillance underwriting side, and our job is to communicate and work with those counterparties, financial advisors, underwriters, and the issuers themselves in order to effectuate transactions, and, uh, and I th I'm very proud of the people that we have that do, do exactly that. So what are, the, what are the four things? Well, the first one, and it's been on the table really for over a decade, that is pension funds. Um, so all municipalities have pension funds in one form or another. And, and, and oftentimes those pension funds are, are underfunded. Um, and if they are underfunded, that presents an economic and political risk for that issuer. And so what, uh, one of the things we've done is we have an actuary who evaluates the strength of a pension fund within that municipality for every transaction that we underwrite. And in doing so, essentially the way we do it is we think, okay, first we try to standardize what the assumptions are. So even if a municipality thinks that their investment return is 9% on their uh, portfolio, we make a more conservative market-based assumption. Then we define what we think the shortfall might be in that program, and then assume that they would have to finance that in order to fill that hole 100%. So now if that means you fill that hole and it's going to require that a mayor um, or a city council would have to triple their tax rates in order to make that hole full, um, that's not likely to be a transaction that we approve. But that's the methodology we go through. And we work on that. Uh, in fact, Les uh, uh, publishes uh, periodically um, uh, updates on pension fund risk which I do think is one of the fundamental things that we focus on for every credit and continue to monitor in a pretty robust way. So the second thing um, that we focus on, and of course it's topical in California at the moment, but across the country in terms of earthquakes are natural disasters. So if you think about it, they fall into sort of four areas and sometimes they kind of overlap. So um, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, tidal waves, and wildfires, okay? Now, there's some that we can't actually underwrite to, and that would a good example of that would be hailstorms or tornadoes. We never know when they're gonna happen, and they, of course, have, have damage that goes with them. Tornadoes, particularly, can be concentrated and run right through the middle of a uh, particular community's downtown area. So the ones we can focus on, though, um, we use external models. We have internal models to, to measure earth, uh, hurricane patterns. Same thing with earthquakes. We look at the durability of um, what's happening in terms of uh, uh, the, how buildings are built in California. Can they withstand a certain percentage of a, an extreme earthquake and have they been built solidly? And do we have enough collateral within that transaction to make sure that the investor is safe um, in what we do? And so that's um, something we've done since inception and works out well. The most, the most recent issue, of course, is uh, wildfires. Um, uh, there's the increased um, in the last two or three years. Um, there's been a, a lot of um, uh, the frequency of, of um, wildfires have been uh, greatly increased. There've been some towns, notably uh, uh, Paradise, has had a lot of attention, where the you know a concentration of wildfires has really pretty much wiped out uh, the economic strength of that area. In our underwriting standard, we look at this very closely. We've actually worked with. Um, Pure, which is um, 
uh, a property and casualty uh, mutual insurance company that has you know really very sophisticated underwriting practices for wildfires. And our standard is one to make sure that we're ensuring an area that isn't prone to wildfires and that is a large enough geographic area so that we don't have a concentration that could get wiped out economically with a single fire. So um, that's a standard that we communicate and we monitor for every transaction that we do that potentially has that kind of exposure. Um, the third thing that we focus on right now is, of course, how are municipalities and their revenue streams being affected by um, the current uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis? And what that means is that there's certain kinds of um, transactions, whether it's, let's say, you know, you've financed something that relies on parking revenues, or you are financed a toll road that may not be getting used as much. And so we focus a lot on how we can help first and foremost our members and how we can um, look to examine what the outcomes are um, in terms of um, financial potential uh, shortfalls for these municipalities. And so, you know, as I said before, to date, uh, as of October 1st, we've had no defaults, but we work very closely with our municipalities. We work with, um, you know, Fieldman Rollup and their clients as well as um, all the underwriting community to make sure that um, investors and municipalities are prepared and unsurprised by events that could affect their uh, financial position economically. So that's the third thing. And, and finally, I think the fourth issue is political risk. So there's a great, there's lots of discussion about will there be an infrastructure bill? Will there be a state and local government aid to, um, uh, that would uh, help bridge some of these shortfall gaps uh, between now and um, and when uh, things go back to uh, a regular environment, hopefully when there's a, a vaccine. Um, but all of these issues, that fourth area, are things that you have to sort of look forward, project what you think might happen, and then try to um, work with um, the market and the issuers to, to make them whole. So, Adam, that's... Uh, Great, thank you for walking us uh, through those uh, four items and certainly can understand why all four of those uh, resonate so strongly. When we think back on bond insurers and um, think about how the world's changed, it, it used to be that there were several that were in the AAA rated range and we would submit, get bids back and just kind of go from there. And now there are none. There, there are none in that AAA range that regularly do this. And so it's a much different environment. Um, Talk to us a bit about how that has changed over time. Sure. Um, well, first I would note that there are, I think, three AAA financial institutions in the world at the moment. So I think after the Great uh, um, Recession, there's been a really a recalibration of what appropriate risk is. So now, um, before uh, the um, Great Recession, there were seven municipal bond insurance companies. Most of them were public. Some of them were trying to become um, public, but they did a wide ring variety of things. And it sort of goes to first that issue that we talked about a, a alignment of interests. So if you are a stock company, um, one of the things that happens in a stressful time, and it, um, during the crisis, I was the chairman of the Association of Financial Guarantors. Um, so I had a firsthand seat. I testified in Washington a number of times on, on the issue, but what, the reality is that uh, municipality, it wasn't municipal finance that caused problems with the companies that collapsed. It was diversifying into other businesses to try to satisfy their investor base, which wanted a growth in earnings and an and expansion of their franchise. The municipal bond world is a finite environment. You know, it, it's not going to grow to a $2 trillion market overnight. Um, and so you have to have an economic model that is disciplined and can be successful over the long haul in this environment. So that sort of gets to the question that Adam was, was asking, and that is, what's changed? Well, first, the application of the, of the product has changed. It used to be when there were seven companies and, some, and a lot of them were AAA, it was credit replacement. So people just said, look, I'm gonna, these bonds are going to be sold on the AAA and forget what the underlying is. That's not true anymore. It's really... It's really credit enhancement. So what we're doing is making a good transaction stronger. And so it trades on a combination of what the underlying is 
and our financial strength as well. So that's one different thing. The second thing is, and the thing that our capital markets group, led by uh, Grant uh, Dewey, has uh, done a really uh, effective job, is to work with institutional investors and their proxies to um, use bond insurance as a hedge in their portfolio. So that um, even if a transaction, let's say LA school district, um, very highly rated credit in its own right, but um, there might be investors who want to in the secondary market, meaning guarantee a bond after it's been issued without insurance. And so it gives greater protection for that portfolio manager in terms of the financial strength or diversification of that portfolio. So that's changed. The third thing is that, and I, I, you know, timing is everything. When we st founded BAM eight years ago, interest rates have dropped absolutely steadily ever since. So um, that leads to two things. What is your value proposition and can you write business that's profitable? And the question is, on that front, uh, discipline. You know, so we are focused, as I said before, on core municipal credits. Nobody uses us in the primary market without saving money for their issuer. That's the facts. Um, we provide a lot of other ancillary services and we can do that because we're a low cost provider as a mutual insurance company that's double A rated. So that's one aspect of what we do. The second aspect of, of, of that is, um, as I said, in the secondary market where we're helping people uh, stabilize their portfolios that they've invested in. And we do that on a regularized basis. In fact, we've just launched a new product with uh, uh, investor tools, uh, it's called Perform, and, and that is where uh, SMA managers can actually wrap a bond in the secondary market right on their screen. And that's a pretty powerful thing, and we're, we're uh, very excited about that yeah. um, because it's really getting right down to the people who are looking at their portfolio and saying, should I have extra protection or not? So those things have changed. Now, what happens in a market like now where there's different credit risk that's where you have to be very focused on credit discipline. We see lots of opportunities right now, an amazing number of opportunities to guarantee bonds, but we stick to our knitting. Essential public purpose, municipal bonds, revenue bonds and general obligation, which are full faith credits of state and local governments. And we spend our time being expert at that and providing what we think is top flight service and underwriting skills and follow up surveillance available to the entire market, both investors and issuers and market participants like financial advisors and underwriters. So Sean, you hit on several key points. There's one I wanna make sure the audience understands and that is serving as a credit replacement versus credit enhancement. And I wanna take the viewers back 15 years. Where, it, where in that environment, the way it worked was you, you oftentimes had to get ratings because the funds needed baseline ratings to be able to buy the bonds. But the conversations when you did a bond sale were all about the, the um, insurer's rating. And, and it didn't seem at the time that there was really any interest on what that underlying rating was as long as it had insurance. That's not the case anymore. Not only will the funds not just accept the insurance, they wanna see and will price, even if you have a double A insurance on there and you have different underlying ratings, those bonds will price differently and then finally, they also do a lot more of their own credit analysis and assign their own ratings to it. So when Sean talked a bit about his postings or BAM's postings online of what they've insured, that probably complements what investors see as well. So a really changed environment with that replacement versus enhancement. Um, I think that SMA um, tool will probably get a lot of traction because those are the folks that are talking directly with those who are gonna be the end um, user, if you will, or holder of the bonds. Right. And, uh, we hope so. We think so. Um, and, and the two fundamental things to remember that makes uh, bond insurance generally and for BAM particularly uh, unique, and that is we pay and then we mitigate. So it's not as if, you know, you like you have a fire in your house and you go to your insurance company and they try to you negotiate about how much it costs to replace the couch that burned. And we pay the investor immediately on time when that, that, when that debt service payment is due. We also have no way to get off the risk. It's a very different thing. We, are, we promise to make every debt service payment that's due on a timely basis until the final 
bond payment has been made for that particular security. That means that you know we're sort of married in an old-fashioned way to every transaction. No prospect for divorce. You know, if you're an investor and you don't like the direction of an uninsured bond, you can sell it and you're out. We don't, we can't do that. We can't get off risk once we've made our decisions. And that's why our credit process is one where we're constantly looking down the road, 20 or 30 years about the fundamentals of a municipality and what they're doing and, and, and why we think this is a solid credit. It's why we like school districts, water and sewer uh, transactions, full faith and credit of state and local governments. And correspondingly, we're not as excited about golf courses. Uh, it's not that golf's not a great game, love the game myself, but I don't think when the crisis starts to hit uh, that uh, your uh, golf course bonds are going to be the first thing that gets paid off. So, Sean, when an uh, issuer, so when, I'm not speaking to when you do it in a secondary market or um, after a transaction, yeah, basically in the secondary market, but when it, you're pricing it for 30 years, but BAM has put some things in place that make it so there's some benefit that if it doesn't last 30 years, there's some benefit to the issuer. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's uh, so. One of the things that was in the old, uh, what I call the old school model, was that um, you would uh, charge a premium, um, and uh, if that particular bond gets refinanced, and essentially at some point in time, every municipal bond gets refinanced. Why? It's because as as the bond continues to mature, it its alternative uh, execution if interest rates even stay the same are are are, bet, are better are lower. You're lower on the curve, and so. So everything, you know, we think about it as the vast majority of bonds get re refinanced. Well, one of the old school cr criticisms was, look, we've paid up front present valued for 30 years for this bond insurance, but this bond gets refinanced in, in year 10 and, and we've paid for another 20 years that we didn't get to use. So what we've done is two things. We've addressed two issues fundamentally. The first is um, we divide our premium that we charge into a member surplus contribution or capital and a risk premium. Now, if that bond gets refinanced, we give that member surplus contribution that they member made when they joined the BAM family and they issued their original bonds, we give them credit for that. So that when they do the new transaction, the cost of the insurance is gonna be quantumly less. So that's the first, the first part of that. The second thing is what we learned in the crisis and what we learn right now, what's going on, when you need to go to the markets to raise capital, that's the time you're not gonna be able to raise capital. Um, and so we set aside a piece of our premium as capital for every transaction, one at a time. And we were actually the first mutual insurance company to actually raise money in the, in the capital markets to make our financial strength undoubted. And so we did a $100 million transaction um, with uh, Goldman Sachs called FIDUS uh, re a couple of years ago, just to make sure that when people are looking at BAM and its financial strength, it's undoubted and it's easily understood. So Sean, it's, I, uh, I'd be good to talk a bit about kind of how that got put together. Because when you look at the investment banks in the United States, we hear a lot about you need permanent capital, right? And that's going, that's going public, if you will. Um, and bam, you've taken an approach where you had to get some upfront money and now you build, build, build every um, policy. But how did that, how did you put together a plan that was so successful there? Well, you know, uh, that's what took uh, a couple of years to put the company together. We were the first, uh, we were the first um, mutual insurance company in New York that was formed in 40 years. Uh, so mutual insurance is one of the oldest forms of in insurance. And one of the things you'll note about it is some of the strongest financial companies in the world, New York Life, um, you know, Mass, Mass Mutual, Northwest Mutual, um, even some of the ones that are now stock companies, all started as mutual insurance companies. And the reason is we have the same parallel interests as our members. They want us to become what? Bigger and stronger me as strong as we can financially. They're not looking for a dividend. They're not looking for our share price to go up because we don't have one. We are here, as I said before, as, an, as, a, as a sort of a regulated utility for the utilization of municipalities and market participants in only the municipal bond market. 
the other thing that when I think about bond insurance is it's a it seems like it's sometimes challenging and I think you've addressed some of it with kind of sticking to your knitting is when times are good the credit spreads narrow so obviously you have to narrow yours to make that work but then when things are bad and credit spreads widen that's when you can go in and you know probably do a little bit better um, but that's also a difficult time to make some of those decisions and um, is it just that you're, you set such a foundation on the front end of this that those decisions are, I don't want to call it, say, easy, but structured? Or is there still always a push and pull that you have to factor in? So uh, we meet, uh, we have a credit committee that meets every day. Uh, and fortunately, you know, our chief credit officer, Suzanne Finnegan, has been at this um, for well over 30 years. Um, and our entire uh, philosophy about underwriting is to make our underwriting standards transparent. They're on our website. We let everybody know what we're doing and, and we educate not only our underwriters, but the market in terms of what our appetite is in any circumstance. But you're right in a market like this, the, the key is to distinguish between, you know, opportunities that are falling in your lap or, or rocks or, or knives. So, um, and the way you do that is that you, you've got to have um, clear standards that you're measuring um, these issuers uh, and what could happen to them. You know, one way to think about it is that the bond insurers, by their nature, uh, spend 99% of the time thinking about things that hopefully happen less than 1% of the time. But uh, it's a conservative, highly evolved credit environment. We make every transaction come before a committee have the analysts pre uh, present it. We have the surveillance people who are the ones who follow on these credits years after we have guaranteed the bonds and make sure there's an information loop so that, again, in this sort of we're married to our partners, our members, we make sure that we track how they're doing over a long period of time. And that information we give to the market for free on our website through our credit profiles. And we think that greatly helps with uh, continuing disclosure for both the issuer who needs to do that, but also for the investor who's saying, you know, we're not a rating agency. We're just saying, here's how they've done. Here's how they did last year. Here's what their peer group looks like. And so those, a summary of those financial metrics, I think help both the investor and help the, the member uh, issuer themselves. Great. And Sean, I think you've done some things with uh, green bonds and trying to establish some sort of platform there. Is that still underway? Uh, it is. In fact, we just uh, expanded our green bond presence. We call it the Green Star Program, and we um, we uh, focus on the uh, international standards of what a, what is a green transaction. So we're not, um, again, much like our municipal underwriting practice. We stick to right in the clearest black and white portion of what are transactions that um, – uh, would be it would constitute green, and that is water purification, clean power, um, and essential uh, kinds of transactions that we think um, the investor market would appreciate understanding that 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 the underlying bond is not only being raised to construct a particular project, but it's it's doing good at the same time for the environment. In Europe, where this uh, the green bond initiative started, um, it's now become you know a very proactive part of the market. Sometimes uh, in the municipal sector, it's 25 to 30 percent of the market, and those bonds actually trade at uh, at a at a tighter or at a better level than the standard bond, just because there's enough people um, uh, in investor in, in particular funds individual investors, particularly um, the younger generation of investors right now, uh, if they can invest in something that also uh, has a social benefit, they do. Yeah, and so what we hear mostly in the United States when we're trying to sell um, or consider green bonds is there's really not a pricing advantage yet. I wonder if you're able to create this commodity type approach that everyone knows what green bond means, whether that's the, what you've talked about here, that might lend itself towards there being a pricing advantage uh, for. So, I think you make an excellent point. Two things about that. One is, I think educating the market isn't critical. And so we describe what is green and, um, and we wanna make sure people understand when we, when we give our green star designation, which incidentally 
is a service we provide for free to the members. We're not trying to make money on this. We're just trying to be a fair, neutral judge. And if the bond is green, we're going to give it our green star um, a designation. The part where, it will, you know, right now it's a demand pull. We're already starting to see some investors say, well, boy, if that's a green star transaction, that's a good fact. You know, I would prefer that over the other. And so I would call that demand pull. Yeah. Over time, when there's enough bonds outstanding so that there can be designated funds, think about it. Franklin, um, I think Nuveen, um, and I think two other of the major institutional investors are starting green funds, green bond funds for their bonds. So you have to have a critical mass yeah. uh, and you have to start somewhere. So our goal, uh, and we've, we've, um, we have put our green star uh, designation on, on a greater number of transactions than anybody else. Um, it's a service and we think ultimately it could uh, benefit in terms of having a lower cost of interest but right now we know it's an important service that investors um, appreciate it. Yeah once those funds get large enough I could really see you know a finance team saying we need to if we are within the realm of possibility of doing so we need to structure this to qualify for the green standards so we can attract x number of funds. I, I certainly see that as something that could come up down the road. Sean, we're getting towards the end of this, and I'd like to ask our guests to talk a bit about their families. And if you wouldn't mind to share with us about your family, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, that is the highlight. Uh, in fact, um, so I'm the father of four children. They're all, uh, I like to think, mostly grown. My uh, old eldest daughter just got married two weeks ago uh, here uh, at our house remotely. Uh, I actually performed the service. Um, which was uh, uh, incredibly exciting. So um, uh, we've got, uh, you know, incredibly proud. Our oldest son runs his own company, um, uh, which is his sort of second startup. Um, it's called Quick Frame. Uh, our daughter who just got married lives in Chicago and is in the advertising business. We have a son who lives in Japan, who's in the equity derivatives uh, sales and trading. And our daughter graduated from uh, Georgetown University, uh, my alma mater, last uh past fall and you know what there's nothing as challenging as being a second semester senior and spending it with your parents uh, <laughs> your social scene is really uh destroyed in that environment <laughs> uh, it's a, well it's a, you know you're never going to be accused of bad behavior your second semester senior year. <laughs> and you know beyond that we have lots of you know family activities that um, we do together i've been um, i was the president of the westminster kennel club uh just the dog show on TV for uh, many, many years. And, um, and we have a, a dog who is sitting over there on a bench right now, listening carefully to everything I say. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's basic exciting where, where we are rem working remotely and living remotely out in Eastern Long Island um, and, uh, and thrilled to be here. Great. Well, I want to thank you for your time. You know, there's a few reasons why I thought it'd be really interesting to have you on our, on our public finance conversation. Um, one is you have made, you are able to describe insurance and make it very interesting. Um, I, for many years, viewed insurance almost like paying a point on a mortgage, right? Let's submit, let's do this. But you have uh, created structures that are more, more interesting and helpful to clients. And now that has made overall, I think, a more of an interest in that field. Um, I have found that your customer service is very good. Now, um, working with a lot of the different team members at BAM, um, we, we know what to expect, when, and, and how to get things done very quickly. And that has spread so that now I think others in the industry have also worked hard on customer service. So that we're very grateful for that because we, have, we can deliver something better for our clients. And so I think you've helped even beyond your uh, corners of, of your office. Um, I think the mutual concept uh, really presents some advantages uh, to, to issuers. And so really um, think that's beneficial. Another thing about you, and I think it lends itself towards customer service and it's more specific to you, is you really make yourself available and accessible as a CEO of your company. Um, I appreciate the time you've taken with me, and I know you've done it with others as well. So. Thank you for all those things and have really enjoyed working with you. Well, Adam, thank you very much. It's really my honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I learned from Jack Byrne, our former chairman and, uh, and a colleague of, uh, and for many years, uh, uh, Warren Buffett, that uh, you've got to spend quality time with your clients. Um, 
It's the most important thing you can do. You learn something and the, and the service you provide is better. And finally, I would be remiss in not, again, being incredibly proud of the people that we have at BAM. I'd encourage anybody to uh, you know, call us, whether it's uh, investor relations or surveillance, or if you've got deals that you're trying to put together, um, we've got the best team on the field, and um, I'm incredibly proud of that. So, Adam, thank you again, really. It, it's, uh, it's always been a pleasure to work with you, and we look forward to uh, a bright future together. Great, and thank you.